Yeah, you think you think your soils group out in the in the management arena has been reduced. In in the research station, there's only a couple of us left. So two or three people who even know anything about soil. <coughs> I'm gonna give you a <coughs> part of what I'm gonna give you is a is a talk I'm preparing for this uh, this webinar thing in Kentucky later in uh, in the month, so I get to practice some on you. Uh, but I will also, uh, and basically the idea is to talk about some uh, carbon management options based on real data from, from studies with, with, uh, that I've actually, all, all the data I'm going to talk about are studies that I've participated in over the years. So I have a good sense of the quality of those data. You know, what I'm going to try and do is look at a number of uh, ideas of how to manage carbon and then rank them based on the data in terms of what would be more or less effective. I'm going to talk some about how that kind of information can be uh, best applied. And Karen asked me also to give you an overview of the long-term ecosystem productivity study where a lot of the data come from. If I have time, I will do that. And I also have a few slides on context for the discussion on adaptive management on Thursday. Some of this may end up being later today, but I'm going to try at least to go through the first three points. Now, <clears throat> I want to start by making sure that, that carbon management can only be viewed in a broader context. Uh, it's going to be, it's very unlikely in my mind that there's going to be carbon management is going to be the next timber uh, of the Forest Service. It's, it's going to be more about managing ecosystem services. It's going to be more about managing for climate change. And I want to point out right off the bat that there, the, with a new planning rule, there's, there's a lot of ideas out there on how to go forward uh, with to manage for a changing climate. And I've been pushing this kind of matrix of philosophical points of view that exist within the stakeholder communities. And it's only, you know, it's carbon management within this kind of uh, view of where, for, where management is headed that I think is most important. So, and it's just one element of, of broader strategies. You know, I, we heard about a skeptic earlier today, and, and there's, you're, there are going to be skeptics out there in these stakeholder communities. I guarantee it. They may be the dominant view. 43% of <clears throat> and, and I'm and, and I would argue under a, an adaptive management framework that those are all legitimate views and should be compared to one another, and that, that you can't select one of these. But no one listens to me very much, but oops. Did I go to? All right. So this first strategy, the, the top rank strategy, ends up being disturbance suppression and rotation extension. If you can avoid disturbances in particularly older stands with high carbon contents, you will clearly accumulate or, or at least not lose uh, as much carbon as doing many other things. This idea of rotation extension is an attractive one as well. <clears throat> Just by putting things off a few years, you're storing in the near term, which is perhaps most important. And, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be taking data from our uh, Siskiyou long-term productivity site. And this is a typical control stand of ours about a hundred year old post fire mixed Douglas fir, tan oak kind of uh, vegetation. And you'll be seeing more on that. But and one of the interesting things about this system is that more than half the carbon's in abo above ground, which is unusual. <clears throat> 
And typically, western forests have, have more than half uh, or less than half above ground. And so it's obvious that this, that pool is desirable to maintain, you know, it's the biggest chunk here. If you can maintain it, you, you lose less. Um, but I think this question of, of whether you can suppress disturbance or not realistically is a very good question, more important in some areas than others. But it's a big if, and it's not an assumption I think we should take uh, lightly. And as soon as you consider disturbance in the picture, then soil carbon and below ground carbon becomes, I would argue, much more important. First of all, it is the, this, here's the data on the effect of wildfire uh, averaged over, this is annualized change in, in carbon. Um, actually, now I gotta look at this. Yeah, this is the effect of wildfire on uh, averaged over 100 years. So if you have one wildfire, you grow a stand and you have an, another wildfire 100 years later. This is the annualized ecosystem carbon change. And we're looking at up close to 6,000 kilograms per hectare per year or six megagrams per hectare per year. Now this mineral soil carbon is the only pool that can transcend intensive fire. And can is the important word in that sentence because fire can affect mineral soil carbon in a number of ways, and I'll show you some of those. All the other pools are either lost in the fire, as in the uh, organic uh, soil layers, typically um, fuel, fine and, and coarse fuel carbon. The above ground vegetation, when it's entirely killed, uh, is generally lost during that 100 year period as well. If not through decomposition, then through con uh, combustion in the next fire. We lost virtually all of our well-decayed wood on the biscuit fire plots. How much soil did you lose through erosion? Good question. Perfect. Perfect timing. Um, <clears throat> this is the one of, uh, uh, of about 30 pictures you can get off of uh, the satellite. Uh, photo showing the smoke plume from the biscuit fire, and this is the whole. This is the whole state of California. Hawaii sits right about here, and this was happening every day for for a month. And and a lot of this material we uh, suspect was was not only um, soot from the fire, but actually mineral soil that got in, encompassed in the plume itself. Um, we lost about two and a half centimeters of fine mineral soil. This is the, the data, 23 megagrams per hectare um, lost of carbon, lost in the fire, and the bulk of it was from the mineral soil. And what's the depth of the A horizon? The A, a horizon was about, averaged about three centimeters, so we lost pretty much all the A horizon. And the question, and nitrogen also, big, big loss there. But here, this is 30% of the soil carbon went up, uh, was, was transported off the site. 23% <clears throat> of the nitrogen. So the question is, is you take um, these relationships between total ecosystem carbon and mineral soil carbon, we, you know, there's a generally an increasing trend there. So if you start at this point and you move down to here, does that mean we've lost uh, the capability of producing carb, of capturing carbon as well? Has there been there an effect on, on site productivity? And we know, I mean, we've, we've documented all of these effects from, from wildfire. Now, just to point out, the data I'm going to refer, that, that that refers to came from this kind of heroic attempt at measuring soil carbon on a stand scale over many places in out uh, and several sampling periods. 
and it's very hard to get good quantitative soil data, or at least it's very laborious. Uh, just to point out, there are some positives from wildfire. There's certainly some short-term increases in nutrient availability, ash. Uh, there may be organic coatings that are uh, affected, perhaps competition from pathogens and so on are, are possibilities. But I, I think it's really critical that we think about not just the loss of carbon, but the loss of the ability to capture carbon again. So is the Biscuit Fire a normal 100-year event, or is it something outside the range of normality? And we have some maps that go back to uh, 1900. You see big patches of mostly young forest down there. And, and I think uh, hot fires in that area are not unusual. I mean, the vegetation is so incredibly adapted to fire. The soil carbon is low, lower than it should be. And I think that reflects this kind of uh, frequent fire it's, it's, it's described as a mixed fire severity uh, zone. It was certainly the biggest fire in a long time, 500,000 acres. But I wouldn't put it out of the realm of, of what's happened in the past at all. How did you figure out you lost an inch of soil? Well, that's a, another whole lecture. But basically, uh, we used, um, we found this pavement of rocks on the surface. We had, we had samples before the fire and after the fire. And we found this pavement of rocks uh, that wasn't there before. So we could then use the amount of remaining uh, fine or, or mineral or, or ash uh, mineral material to reconstruct the, what was lost. And you're assuming the bulk of that loss was from the but it's Convection. Convection. Okay. We, no, and, it's, and that's largely an assumption. Um, it, we have some circumstantial evidence. We didn't see massive, the amount of soil that you would need to see at the bottom of these units, you know, building up in the, in the ditches. I mean, so there was clearly some water erosion, well, too. The reason I'm asking is because I've done quite a bit of work on post-fire, you know, looking at it. And it's really hard to determine how much soil loss you've had because you don't see the erosion. You don't see it physically building up somewhere else. So you come to the conclusion, well, we probably didn't lose much, but you can see exposure of rocks that weren't there before. You can see exposure of roots that weren't there. And then you go, well, was it just duff that was consumed? Mm -hmm. In your case, you're saying it might have actually that's, I think, a very, it fits with the, the theory. People, the, the meteorologists have measured wind speeds of up to 100 miles an hour right at the soil surface. Uh, people have measured, have looked at smoke and found mineral soil in smoke. So it's, you know, fine, fine materials in smoke. So it's, it fits. Personally, I think on, in a lot of forested sites, uh, I mean, we saw a lot of things moving around. But most of that was trapped very locally, you know, in wind throw pits, behind logs and stumps. And we just, we should have seen a ton of it at the bottom of the hill, and we, we did not. The only way it could have left would have been completely entrained in water without leaving a deposit at the bottom of the hill. And I, and I think that's probably the least likely. Did you see a differential of charcoal transport versus fine soil transport off the A horizon? Yeah. I think most of the charcoal burned up in the fire. Yeah, which is a, a, an issue with charcoal. If you have charcoal near the surface and you have a fire, it's going to burn up. It's not as long lasting as, as people, you know, if it's down in the mineral soil, yeah, sure it could. I see on some fires, though, they create large bars of charcoal down slope, you know, in the drainways and stuff. We didn't but see that. We saw a lot of that over by burns where it, would, it washed off and basically took that charcoal downstream and created like two foot of bars down Yeah, the we, we saw none of that. All right, now I'm going to go talk about some other, the strategy number two. When you have a disturbed system, managing that early seral vegetation, particularly nitrogen fixers, becomes incredibly important. And the data I'm going to show you here is actually from New Hampshire on um, our sandbox experiment. And that's not Mark Harm, even though it looks like him. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, 
what we did was construct some 7 by 7 meter lysimeters, uh, 5 feet deep, planted a different species on, on those lysimeters so we could track all the inputs and outputs through these systems. <clears throat> and when we look at the carbon change in mineral soil and in organic soil, we found some really fascinating things. And these turn out to be the biggest changes of any that we've uh, recorded. <laughs> Namely, if you keep an area free of vegetation, you can lose tremendous amounts of soil carbon. So this whole notion of, uh, of uh, herbiciding the competing vegetation, keeping ground open, is I think a big question mark because that carbon can be uh, can actually disappear from the system quite rapidly. We're going to see this pattern develop further with Douglas fir, but under the pines, we also saw uh, substantial losses of mineral soil carbon, along with some gains in the litter layer. The two hardwoods, black uh, European black alder and black locust, on the other hand, had virtually no change in mineral soil and some uh, gains in the litter layer. So the kinds of vegetation you get after disturbance can be very important. Do you have a sense of where that carbon went when you kept it there? Did it just um, mineralize out or was it? You know... um, it, was, it was decomposed by microbes. It did not show up as increased. I mean, there was maybe a little bit of uh, bicarbonate in the, in the leach, leachate, but that, that was a small portion of the total. And this is a conceptual model I want to push on you. Um, it basically, we look at the solar capture potential of different growth forms versus the soil nutrient and water capture potential. And as you go from non-vascular plants to grasses to shrubs and to various kinds of trees, there's an interesting thing that happens. Mosses and lichens, and to a certain extent annual plants, cannot put out a foliar array that's big enough to capture all the solar radiation coming in. So the NPP is automatically lower. They also do not have the root development of the shrubs and trees, so their ability to capture nutrients and water is also lower. What happens that's kind of interesting with some of the shrubs, and you can't say this about all shrubs, but is that the shrubs can put up a, a foliar array to capture all of this, basically all of the solar energy. Sometimes they can put roots out that are deeper than trees. And when that happens, it's, it's fascinating because their growth form prohibits them from accumulating carbon in woody tissue. Just because typically like a terminal bud turns into a flower and then it branches, you know, and then those turn into flowers and they branch. So they, they just simply cannot pack away the wood, the carbon in woody tissue. But if the leaf, if the net primary productivity is the same, that carbon has to go somewhere. And it seems to me it's going into the soil. So that's a, I think a really, this needs to be further explored, but I think it's an important idea. Hardwoods, you know, sometimes conifers have very shallow rooted rooting so they may be running into problems uh, on some sites with nutrient availability. Okay, now let's turn to alder. Now the, the data here is uh, from a chrono sequence. It's less certain than the data I've been speaking about. This was actually my master's thesis, no less. But, you know, alder on the west side <coughs> can outgrow Douglas fir initially tremendously. This is on the Willamette, and you can see alder and Douglas fir planted at the same time, you know, vast differences in growth rate. Uh, the, now, while there's other vegetation here, like ferns and, and other plants, which are photosynthesizing and capturing solar energy, this is uh, radically uh, more rapid, and we see a tremendous, uh, at least doubling of soil carbon <clears throat> in as little as 40 years under alder. 
compared to Douglas fir. I, I frankly think the most uncertain number here is this is this increase under Douglas fir in the mineral soil. I I'm not convinced that's real, but we don't have I don't have the data I want for that one. Now, being a nitrogen fixer is a big part of that as well, and the, because it's more than carbon, it's the nitrogen as well frequently. So there's good reason to explain that, that increase. Now if we go back to the biscuit fire or to the long-term productivity site on, on the siskiyous and look at the part that was not burned up in the fire, we have treatments that include regeneration harvest or a clear cut planted to close spacing to Douglas fir with uh, leaving 15% of the, of the harvested biomass on the ground. These were about 100-year-old stands uh, versus this hardwood mixture, mainly tan oak and madrone, some knob cone pine, some Douglas fir in these two different treatments. And again, we're seeing a decline in soil carbon underneath the Douglas fir turns out to be significant in, in one of those and almost significant in the other one. On the other hand, we're seeing increases under this hardwood uh, mixture. And I want to show you this in more detail. Um, but the theory here that I'm putting forward, I, and I can't, we don't have substantiation of this, but the, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that Douglas fir may be seeking out through its microbial associates the nutrients in the upper mineral soil, really the like five to 20 centimeter zone. And in the process of, of obtaining those nutrients, the carbon associated with those nutrients is decomposing or being freed. And that's not happening with the hardwoods. That's my theory. Um, The carbon. Do you mean the nutrients? Well, well but are the nutrients? The nutrients are be, being taken up, but the nutrients in the soil are associated with carbon compounds. And those, that carbon is disappearing in the process. That's my theory. It is, and so you're trading it off. You're taking soil carbon and you're putting it into above ground carbon, which may have consequences down the road. I have a, somewhere down here, I have a more detailed um, thing on that. Uh, we'll get back to that. Another, I think, second to last example uh, on the east side, <coughs> looking at shrubs and adding shrubs and hardwood, hardwoods to conifer systems. This is the Pendleton Canyon Exclosure, which was built in 1939. That's a photo taken in 1944. And the ungulates on outside the exclosure basically wiped out the shrub cover. You go there now, and this is like a postage stamp where this exclosure is, full of cherry and some ceanothus and things like that. Um, and what we see here is an increase in the organic uh, soil horizon, no change in the mineral in terms of carbon. But, you know, there are, that change is important because it changes infiltration, water holding capacity. Turns out that, that organic matter has, is rich in, in basic cations and that actually extends into the mineral soil as well. <coughs> Okay, so now we have some data on prescribed fire because in 2001, one of our treatments on the, on the long-term productivity experiment was to apply a prescribed fire. It was just fortuitous as this was one year before the biscuit fire. And when the biscuit fire came, it just went completely around this area because there was no fuels, they were burned up. But the interesting thing is that in terms of carbon loss, it wasn't that different from what happened in the, in the more lightly burned areas in the biscuit fire.
and this is to build on Mark's point earlier, if you then annualize this, put it on a 100-year uh, fire basis, that 23 megagrams per hectare becomes uh, whatever, 230 kilograms per hectare per year. And so this is the, the intense fire, light fire. But then if you do prescribed fire every 20 years, you know, you, you're going to lose more than you lost in that 100-year basis. So prescribed fire, I'm, you know, I, this really bugs me because I, I always wanted prescribed fire to work out because well, it's the only cheap thing to do. Right. You apparently haven't lost any other two right. scenarios. So how does that balance out? You have to, that has to come into play. Um, and, and there's some other things here that, that need, you need to consider. You know, these, this is from a fairly heavy fuel load. And, and, and presumably in 20 years that fuel load wouldn't be quite as high. So these might be smaller with time. And personally, the, you know, when, when all the trees are killed in a fire, um, I think that needs to be added into the equation, which will change this tremendously, because the trees aren't, aren't killed here. And so those, the decomposition of those trees over that 100-year period and their probable consumption in the next fire, not to mention contribution to the fuel load in the next fire, are other things to, to worry about. So there's the productivity angle and this, this above ground carbon fuel angle. The, the lowest ranking strategy of the ones I considered is managing residues and thinning. In our experiment, we actually, when we harvested these units, we left 15% of the biomass on the ground in one treatment. We took it all away in another treatment. Because at that time, everyone thought adding woody debris will improve site productivity. It was, uh, and, and so we included that as a treatment. Here's a high residue thinned stand and a low residue thin stand. We still have a lot of smaller stuff here, but there are bigger trees left in this one. And again, it was only 15% of the harvested trees, so there's fewer additions in those. When we look at the data, they're all small. Very small changes. Control, no, no change. The thin, very, very small change. The, we already saw the Douglas fir change and the, and the hardwood mixture change. And the residues seem to um, you know, <clears throat> this again is unburned. So where we had additional residue, we do get some additional uh, carbon in the hardwood mix and in the thinned. But we didn't in the fir, mainly because of that loss in the mineral soil. There actually was a loss uh, or gain at the surface. And here's the data I was talking about. <clears throat> You know, with soils data, you can't just, it's hard to portray this. You've got to, to me, I've got to know what's happening with depth. And so here's those losses in Douglas fir happening at what's about 5 to 20 centimeters on both of these uh, treatments. With the Pioneer mix, hardwood mix, we see no real significant, no significant changes, but they all are tending on the positive side with the thinned. We're getting some back and forth, some significant changes and so forth, but the, when, they, when you add those up, they're, they're very small. All right, so that's, this is the sum of the data I'm going to present um, on this topic. And I, and I want to, first of all, make a few uh, kind of synthetic comments. Soil change can be much more rapid than people think. That's, I want to impress that point on you. You know, if people are saying soil carbon is constant, don't believe them. <clears throat> I mean, these are huge changes taking place over relatively short periods of time. Second point, it's hard to interpret these data because they're on different temporal scales. And a lot of these processes are not linear. So, you know, while this kind of change can happen in a five year period, we track this over a longer time, those, those changes diminish. 
just like the wildfire one does. And I didn't consider things like erosion, you know, highly weathered soils, biochar, compaction, so on, um, which in those really ought to be evaluated. I just don't have the data to speak to those. And, and therefore, I came to this conclusion in terms of uh, carbon benefit that, that we just went through. Now, it, uh, stepping away from this a little bit, it's, it's really, you cannot go approach this with a purely carbon mindset. And just to throw a few little details at you. You know, for example, the, in the fire, the mature stands that were thinned uh, fared better than the controls. And it was because, in part, the tan oak and madrone seemed to hinder the movement of the fire in those stands. Uh, now, I'm, now, I said that wrong. The, the thin stands, we removed the hardwood understory. And they fared worse than the controls where they were retained. Secondly, um, it's not easy. Nothing's easy. Uh, in the case of the increasing organic matter in the exclosure, certainly there, there are potential benefits. And, and uh, I think I skipped over the fact that, that the trees growing with those shrubs actually were growing substantially faster than the trees outside. They were, this is the opposite of what you would expect. There was not a competition. There was benefit from having those shrubs there. Might have something to do with water holding capacity, CEC, and so on. Um, these soils in the under alder are changing quite dramatically. The aggregation, the bulk density can drop uh, really substantially under alder. It's really, it's actually the soil comes up because it's, it's the organic matter builds in it and, and it and changes infiltration and another of important uh, variables. Weathering rates, we've studied weathering in these sandbox studies, are uh, substantially tenfold higher under the pines. Pines are actively mining the soil for cations. A lot of the photosynthesis from NPP is going into that process. Um, Same is true with the alders. So it's, it, you really need, have to have an ecosystem view. Carbon, it's, it's, a, it's a mistake to just kind of focus solely on carbon. It's a mistake, going back to my earlier slide, to uh, focus on carbon change or carbon management alone. It's going to happen within a much broader context. Um, so I, I came to the conclusion that <clears throat> to mitigate, if that's really your, your objective in an older carbon rich stand, stay away from disturbance if you can, um, extend rotations. Uh, you know, if you can get more hardwoods and shrubs in those systems, great. Uh, thinning to increase individual vigor uh, may not affect mitigation that much, but it, would, it has, may have other reasons to do it. I think we need to take a fundamentally different view of young and disturbed or low carbon forests, where personally I think managing NPP uh, would make a lot more sense principally to uh, achieve more ecosystem services. And we've been developing this green wave model, which basically links NPP to ecosystem services and also through feedbacks, disturbance and other feedbacks. And I, and I don't have time to, uh, to explain that um, maybe next year. So I think, oh, wait a minute, I've got a few more things. So, Moving from the stand to the landscape scale is another thing to, to contemplate. Uh, in older stands it, within your landscape matrix, you may choose to focus on carbon accumulation and storage. 
And then in areas with, that have been disturbed or, or younger stands, you may focus on increasing site productivity to, to increase that total of services. And in some limited areas, there's, I think, some reason to think you might be able to decrease site productivity as a way to uh, reduce the costs of, of maintaining fuel breaks. You know, if we know how to increase productivity, it's, we should know how to decrease productivity too. So, and in, in the end, um, you know, we've got to start as a group, as a, a community, starting to think about a, some new, a new tool bag to help you guys in, in designing projects. All of this lies, the foundation is in your knowledge of how, in, how soils drive net primary productivity and carbon. That's, you can't do any of this without that. Um, and then we need to start putting forth ideas on how to improve or degrade soil properties to achieve these objectives. And I'm repeating myself here. Here's a, we can actually adopt some things that have already been tried. For example, on the Wind River Experimental Forest, Back in 1939, it was a good year, a uh, forester after Yakult burn had swept through Wind River twice. He was kind of desperate and planted uh, intermixed alder and Douglas fir on the kind of side ridges <laughs> of, of that area. The changes that happened, you know, so the idea was the alder would be a wet blanket, so if it came through, it would stop the fire. What happened there was the soil carbon doubled. Tree volume, total Douglas fir and alder, doubled. Site index jumped a whole unit of Douglas fir in those mixtures. The alder finally died out, and you go there now, and there's these trees that are vastly taller in this strip running up the hill. I mean, they should have planted alder everywhere on that site because it was so, you know, the two fires, really bad idea. Uh, the nitrogen capital must have been a tiny fraction of what it used to be. But this idea of planting um, wet blankets or you know, altering with hardwoods, adding hardwoods to the system to help with fire, I think is a good idea in general. <coughs> a second one, which we don't have much data on yet, is another long-term productivity, a treatment in a long-term productivity study up on Mount Hebo. And here, we started with 70-year-old plantations from the original Hebo Hebo plantation, which was, again was a fire. And we thinned um, to 30 to 40 trees per acre. And in this one treatment, underplanted with alder. And we're now at this point where the alder is growing up in between the, the Douglas fir, because it's open enough for that to happen. And the idea is that there was some wood products produced in the th original thinning. And from this point forward is to go through, cycle through 35 year alder rotations, taking the alder out every 35 years, leaving these minimum of 10 old growth trees per acre to, to give you late successional habitat. And, and meanwhile, every 35 years producing wood products. This is on the ground and it has yet to be re-measured, but <clears throat> you know, this is the kind of idea, innovative ideas that I think we need a lot more of. I started to try to come up with a dry landscape one, you know, and I gave up uh, because, you know, I realized, you know, I need, I need the soils data for that area and I need to work with you guys to develop these things. So, so I'm not even gonna go into this. Um, and, and I don't know what our time is, Karen. Well, I can give you a quick overview of long-term productivity and I'll get back to the adaptive management thing later. The long-term productivity experiment is four experimental sites uh, in western Oregon and Washington. Our one eastern site was nixed by the Wenatchee and another one by the Umatilla, but that's another story. Uh, Chris, Chris Lake. Not yours, perhaps. No, no, 
this is a long-term ecosystem productivity study. This is not the long-term soil productivity program. And uh, this, these are the treatments that are, go into the LTEP uh, study, basically looking at pure Douglas fir, this pioneer mixture, and uh, thinning to, to increase and improve late successional conditions compared to a control with various levels of biomass uh, retention. The full design was Im implemented on the, on the Washington DNR land near um, Forks, and that's what it looks like on Google Earth. Um, you, it's this case we have four replications of all of the treatments. It's a rather enormous investment. We have soils, stand level soils data from not all of them, but most of them. We skipped the mid um, wood treatment because it was too expensive. The Hebo one I mentioned before is a much more limited version of the study and it actually has some fundamental differences in the design, but it's up by Mount Hebo on the Oregon coast. The Willamette site is uh, south, of the end, south of the McKenzie in a place called Isolation Block, surrounded by Weyerhaeuser land. And then the Siskiyou site, which I've been talking about mainly. All of those remain unmeasured except for this, uh, the Rogue River Siskiyou site. So it's a great opportunity if the Regional Soils Program wants to get some top quality carbon data, they know where to come. And I'll, I'll stop with that.